Welcome once again to the AMA Expo stage presented by Nationwide Insurance and it's my privilege to introduce Tyler Collins and he actually has the Precision Hawk here today. So how about a nice AMA welcome for Tyler and we're looking forward to your presentation. So a little bit about Precision Hawk's background and, and my background personally. I've, I've actually been an, a member of AMA since I was in eighth grade. So, so about 15 years now I've actually been flying model aircraft. Uh, went to school to be a pilot just because I love aviation and then fell in to, uh, into doing this as a career now. Um, and being able to be able to provide these solutions to the customers that, that can really make use of it is incredible. So Precision Hawk has been around now for about seven years. We were founded in Toronto, Canada. Our founders uh, were remnants of the Canadian Space Agency who really had a background in artificial intelligence development and, and building that into the Mars rovers. So being able to bring that knowledge and, and that intelligence and to be able to teach uh, a flying platform what good data is, how do I fly safely, so that I can consistently get the information that I need to be able to make uh, useful and uh, economical changes to what I'm doing. Uh, we're, we're a company of about 80 employees now uh, scattered between Raleigh, North Carolina and Toronto, Canada. Our hardware and sensors are actually fully produced in Toronto, which allows us to export uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, we've, we've taken on, and you saw one of our investors in the video, uh, Bob Young, the founder of Red Hat Linux, one of the largest Linux distributions in the world. We've, we've also recently closed another $10 million round of investment with Intel and Millennium Technology Ventures, who invested in Alibaba, Facebook, Twitter, um, and a number of other technology companies. So what, what these companies and what these investors are really looking at doing is not focused so much around us flying a platform. It's focused around what are we doing with the data that we're collecting with that platform to be able to make actionable changes. It's projected that in the US alone, the economic impact of the UAS industry is going to be huge. In just uh, the next 10 years, they're projecting it to be over $13 billion of new jobs in the US industry. So these jobs, what are they? They're not just somebody going out to a field and flying this aircraft. They are the pilots, the operators, yes, mechanical engineers, aeronautical engineers, computer science engineers, geospatial science engineers, agronomists, uh, physicists, so that we can actually solve real world problems and getting away from just flying the aircraft itself. And this is really going to impact um, the economy in, in numerous ways of other than just providing jobs in various different industries. These industries that, that we see the UAS industry starting to impact uh, are so broad spectrum that it, it's not just agriculture, it's not just oil and gas. But all of these industries are looking to collect data utilizing the same sensors and looking to be able to provide useful information out of that data to benefit their businesses. So agriculture in the United States and agriculture around the world at this point is by far the biggest user of UAS technology at this time and it's only continually growing. So being able to go out, fly my farm, see what's going on in that farm, understand why that's happening in that farm and then being able to go out and change what I'm doing to decrease my inputs and increase my outputs. And there are so many widespread impacts that, that just by doing that can have on the, um, on the uh, environment and the economy by now I can start to feed more people, but I don't have runoff of dangerous chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, just because I'm spraying an entire field with uh, a standard amount. So we're seeing drastic changes in various areas of these industries, and that's just agriculture alone. We see that in livestock, being able to manage that livestock, uh, starting to be able to detect when uh, cattle are sick from the sensors that we can fly on the aircraft. We can pinpoint where they're at. If they have tags on those, those cattle, we can actually identify which cattle that is as we fly over. In the mining industry, this is huge. Being able to provide information to them rapidly so that they can monitor on a weekly basis, a daily basis, what exactly is going on in their mine? Are we meeting quota every week? What's in our stockpiles? How do we plan for logistics? Uh, and this goes for the rest of the industries up on the screen. They're, they're all looking to what can I do with the data? The big focus is now moving away from the platform itself because we're able to teach the platform how to fly, how to collect data, what good data is, how do I fly safely, and ensure that when I'm up in the air collecting that data, nothing else is going to happen. 
uh, I want to really kind of give an overview of what some real world examples are of where we've been able to see impact from the UAVs and being able to utilize the information that we're collecting with those UAVs. So the pictures you see up here on, on March 22nd of 2014 in a small town just north of Seattle, Washington, uh, a mudslide ripped through a rural community uh, in a freak accident that, that eventually took 30 homes and 42, 42 lives. So to give, to give kind of a, an overview of what this area is like, we're in the middle of two valleys. The peaks on the valleys are at 1,500 feet above where we're at in the bottom. And of course, being in Seattle at, at this time of the year when it's raining a lot, the, the fog is low, there's a lot of clouds, and when they need to get in with the geologist to see exactly what's going on with that terrain, and not even talking about the search and rescue effort, but seeing what's going on with the terrain to ensure that the people in the search and rescue are not at risk of a secondary slide coming down on top of them. Uh, they would typically use manned LIDAR flights to be able to map that terrain as well as terrestrial information, terrestrial laser scanners, to see how much that dirt is moving because it can move up to two feet per day after that slide. So Precision Hawk was invited to, to come up two days after the event had occurred through an organization called Roboticists Without Borders, kind of a play on Doctors Without Borders. So we were invited up through a couple of government organizations, FEMA, USGS, uh, to come up and be able to provide near real-time data so that the geologists and even the search and rescue workers could plan out what their next moves were and ensure that what they were doing was safe. So um, the weather was terrible. We didn't have a lot of options. We're in US airspace, and especially under a temporary flight restriction. We can't just walk in and just fly. It's, it's completely against federal regulation. Through the organization Roboticists Without Borders, which is affiliated with Texas A&M University, we were able to work with the FAA with our platform and get what's called an emergency COA uh, within 24 hours. So we were able to obtain this COA to fly in restricted airspace to be able to provide this data back to the people who needed it in real time. So we, we were very successful at this. We were able to go out and using various different sensors with this platform, um, reconstruct that terrain very accurately in 3D. So what they can do with this, and I'll show some examples in a little bit, but what they can do with this is in an automated way start to detect what some of these changes are occurring. So I can start to automatically measure how much it's moving and see if there's any drastic changes. While um, we can help the, the emergency responders plan their routes to get into the disaster zone because it, it was called the moonscaping because it was, it was almost like walking on the moon because you physically could not get to the areas where you needed to get. So they would dig those areas out with excavators. And, and this is the fascinating thing about the UAVs and the sensors that we're able to to fly and then the, the data analysis that we're doing on the back end is we learned multiple applications that we had never anticipated while we were out there. By showing the data to the excavator uh, operators, they realized that, um, okay, now I can see where sand is, I can see where clay is. So because I have to retract my excavator if I want to drive in sand and I have to retract it if I want to drive in clay. And their big problem was they would get out in the middle of this, this moonscape and they would get stuck. So they were able to utilize the data, the same data that the geologists were using to monitor the, the landslide, to monitor the river buildup that had been blocked by the landslide, to plan the routes to get in uh, in a much more effective manner. So we were able to quickly turn that, that data around in just a matter of hours, instead of a matter of days, like they were doing with manned LIDAR data, to be able to get that in the hands of the people who could use it. Another great example is ocean dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. These are, these are issues that are created by us. We pollute, the, we pollute the rivers, we pollute the culverts, and now we have to be able to go and find out where that pollution's coming from. Well, until today, the, the top of the line technology to do this was two guys in a small boat with a cup. They would go sample the river, come back, and, uh, and do analysis on that, and it was highly, highly inefficient. This, this platform has the ability to actually land on water. And if we can land on water, we can start to take water samples. So it can autonomously go out, go to the different culverts, take water samples, and start to track and map where this pollution's coming from just by, by going out and doing it in a fully automated workflow. So, so the key that I'm going to keep touching on is the UAV for us is a tool to acquire the data and information that we need to solve real world problems. 
So, and getting into about the UAV itself, um, the sensor is a very important factor into what we're doing. If we don't have a sensor on board, why are we flying this in the first place outside of maybe we're, we're a hobbyist? So we, we attach a sensor in a fully plug and play payload system uh, to where we can actually capture that data in a fully automated process. So one of the biggest issues uh, surrounding the world as, as we get into the next couple of decades is population growth. It's something that's always talked about, but not many people have ideas of how to deal with the problem. Uh, and one of the biggest things that the researchers are saying that in the next uh, 20 years, as we go from 7 billion to 10 billion people, we're going to have to increase our food production between 70 and 100% to be able to keep up with, with supplying food to all of these people. So where does a UAV come into play in feeding the world's populations? Well, we talked about agriculture a little bit, and we'll show some examples of, of what we've been able to achieve in agriculture. But if we can suddenly send a UAV out very inexpensively to third world countries where their farming techniques are not up to what they are here, their yields are not to what they are in the United States, they might not be utilizing farmland because they don't know that it is uh, growable land. So if we can go out and identify these areas, increase yields throughout the world, and, and provide um, actionable data to where those farmers can then increase their outputs and increase their yields, then we can play a small factor into actually being able to uh, sustain the world as, as we grow. So some of the things that we've been doing and working with the seed companies, the, the companies actually making the seed and, give, and giving those to the growers is um, being able to automatically count corn in a field. If you can imagine the seed companies as they develop their various forms of genetic seeds, they need to know exactly how many plants are coming out of the ground in their research plots. And, and this does have application in production fields as well. But typically, up until today, state-of-the-art research to do this was getting high school kids in the middle of the summer in Colorado in 110 degree weather, walking through a field with a clicker and clicking all day long. And if you can imagine by the end of the day, the 12 year old in the field clicking at hardly any pay is just walking and clicking because they don't want to be there. So for a company like that, that's getting error rates of up to 25% on their stand counts in corn, um, being able to fly over in a short flight and in a fully automated process without any human touching any of the data being able to count every single plant in that field uh, provides them the information to build ge better genetics and build better plants. Uh, an application that this has in, say, a farm field. A farmer goes out, plants his seeds. His tractor messes up, and not all the seeds get planted in a row or two. He's not going to know that, especially if it's in the middle of the field, until partway until the season gets in and it's too, too late to replant, or he may never see it because it's in the middle of the field. Well, we can get up directly after those plants start coming out of the ground and see where, see where he may have misplanted. And he can actually go back and make that change, which, if it's over a long row, could be twenty dollars or $30,000 worth of crop. And just numerous other things that we've been able to automate with our relationships with various universities uh, to bring this, this cutting-edge research and development to people who can actually put it to use. So. Um, being able to measure biomass of plants, predict yield, start to track diseases and identify where diseases are at. So if I can identify a disease, a great example that we've done is potato farmers. One of the biggest problems in a potato field is potato blight. If that potato blight spreads throughout the entire field, I can lose that entire field. And then I have to rely on insurance money that affects the economy because of the insurance companies have to pay that money out. And, and I don't get to sell that crop. So with some of the sensors that we use, coupled with the automated processing that we can run algorithms on top of those that data, we can actually identify and map potato blight at early stages so then that farmer can go out and take corrective action to stop the spread of that disease so he doesn't lose his entire crop. Same thing with date palm trees in the United Arab Emirates. A big problem for them is uh, something called the red palm weevil, which is an infestation that burrows itself in the tree and you don't know it's there until it's infested that entire tree farm. And you can't see the trees wilting with your bare eyes until it's, it's way too late, the tree's already dead. So what we've been able to do with the government of the United Arab Emirates, using, utilizing some of our sensors, developing the analysis for them, we can actually identify which trees are infected with that red palm weevil well before we can see that with our human eyes so that they can go and stop that infestation before it spreads to the rest of the, uh, the tree farm. 
Uh, and just a couple other quick examples. We can detect nutrients in crops. So nitrogen, we can detect um, moisture levels in the soil, moisture levels in the crop. So we can take all of these pieces and put them together as a puzzle and then go back and say, okay, we understand what the problem is. Here's how we need to take corrective action and, inc and improve what we're doing. So a little bit about our platform. Precision Hawk, we manufacture our own platform. We integrate and manufacture our own sensors. The platform itself, it's a fixed wing UAV. Uh, we chose this so that we can, we can cover a large area at a single time. We get about a 45 minute flight time out of it um, and it's fully autonomous. So, which means when I get, even before I get out to the field, I know where I'm going to fly. If it's my same field, I know that I'm gonna fly it on a weekly basis or every two days. I create that flight plan once of the area that I want it to survey, and that's it. I let the plane figure out the rest. What we've learned as a company, and, and getting into what I'll be talking about in a few minutes, the more intelligence that we can build into the platform, the more that we can teach it what is good data, what is safe flight operations, if something happens, how do I get back on the ground safely? How do I monitor all my components to identify a problem before it happens so that I don't have to risk anything happening while I'm in the air? As we remove that human element from the equation and let the intelligence make its own decisions, we inherently over time saw that flight operations were safer. If something occurred in the air, the plane can intelligently get itself on the ground without an inexperienced pilot trying to land it very nervously and it knows what good data is. So I've told it where I want it to fly. I plugged in one of those sensors, which we have about 15 different sensors right now, and it figures out how to survey that entire area for that sensor and get good data. Um, if, it, if it misses a section in that field, it knows what that good data is, so it'll actually circle around and get that area again before it comes back and lands. So when the survey is completed, plane comes back and lands, the data is pulled off into a software program, click upload, it uploads to the cloud, that data is processed, it's analyzed, and that final product is delivered back. And that final product is, uh, it might be a map, it might be a report based on whatever that analysis that I'm looking to do. If I'm looking for potato blight, if I'm looking for, to quantify how much hail damage uh, occurred in my cornfield. So, in, in talking about the technical expertise about this, uh, Precision Hawk, we, we do everything we can to abide by the current FAA regulation, which means in the United States, all of our operations um, are conducted under COAs, uh, as well as our clients have COAs, and then they are filing for the 333 exemptions. By building in a lot of this technology and building it up a report through the various other governing agencies from uh, the CAA in Europe, um, Australia, CASA, uh, Transport Canada, uh, we were one of the first platforms certified by the FAA under a COA to where an uh, agriculture researcher with no experience in aviation no experience in remote control aircraft was authorized by the FAA to go out and operate this aircraft in New York. So that was the first time where an, an agronomist can actually operate the platform without any aviation experience um, to where this platform knows what safe is, it knows where it should not fly, and it knows how to get on the ground safely if something happens. And it's, it's, it's the combination of being able to, to educate what is good and what is not good, educate what is safe and what is not safe, in combination to being able to teach the platform uh, what is safe and what's not safe. So we, the way we see it, especially in the commercial industry, the people who need the data, who need to go out and actually collect that data for their own use, they're not going to be pilots. They're going to be inexperienced. So we want to do everything we can to lead up that effort and working with organizations such as the Small UAV Coalition, who is comprised of uh, companies such as Amazon, Google. Uh, we're a member of that as well who are going to Congress, speaking to Congress, to really push safe integration, safe education of small UAVs into the national airspace system, working with uh, other organizations such as the AMA, the EAA, AUVSI, to ensure that we do this properly. And, and ensuring that industry-wide, we are developing the technology to be able to allow these aircraft to make some of those smart decisions themselves, especially when it's not a, an experienced RC pilot or an experienced pilot at the sticks. So talking about the payloads, this is, this is really the most important factor about the UAV itself. The payloads, we currently have about 15 different payload systems and this is what actually collects the data. And, and you can see here on the Precision Hawk system, I don't actually have a real payload with me, but 
um, I have a representation that it's, it's all plug and play. I've told it where I want it to survey. I plug the payload into the bottom. Same with the battery. It knows what payload that is. It knows what I want to survey. So from that point, it actually will build the flight plan on its own to collect the data uh, to ensure it's getting good data. Some of, the, some of the payloads and sensors that we currently have range from a visual sensor. So I can do regular mapping. I can do 3D reconstructions with that regular visual sensor as well. Very accurate 3D reconstructions of the terrain. Multi-spectral cameras, which can see in bands of light that our human eyes cannot see and break those bands of light down so that we can start to do more analysis and calculations on that data to get to those end solutions. Hyperspectral sensors, which can see in hundreds of bands of light that our human eyes cannot see, uh, which a lot of researchers use to develop their algorithms. Uh, LIDAR systems, so I can actually measure the terrain. Uh, and thermal systems, so I can map out thermal areas. So if I'm looking for heat stress and crop, I can start to see that with these sensors. And getting into more advanced sensors, such as synthetic aperture radar systems. Uh, Maybe we'll see ground penetrating radar systems, magnetometers so that I can measure the varying magnetic field of the earth as I fly over it. Very good if I want to identify what kind of minerals are under, underneath that ground. Um, electromagnetic sensors so that I can start to determine soil type from the, from the air. So which soil type is another form of data that has to be fed into some of these um, applications to get to that final thing that says, this is what I need to go do to my field. So. Again, the key is not the platform itself, not us flying the platform. I don't care how I get that data. All I care about is that I get data, it's good data, and I can make actionable decisions off that data to benefit what I'm doing for my business. So some of the calculations that this aircraft does in flight. So we've built an entire mission control computer and of course, being invested in by Intel, we're working very closely with Intel to develop new powerful technologies that we can build on board this aircraft itself so that it can be smarter while it flies, it can be intelligent, and start to make decisions deterministically about what's going on uh, as it's collecting that data. So before it even builds its flight plan, when I launch the aircraft, it doesn't know what direction it's going to fly. The reason being, when I get up to altitude, I need to know what direction the wind is, wind is blowing, and I need to know how fast that wind is blowing. So the very first thing that this does when I actually launch it is it will go up to its cruising altitude, do a couple of circles, get a bearing on the wind direction and wind speed. It knows the optical parameters of its sensor, and that's when it will actually build a flight path back and forth across that area to survey that area. While it's flying, just like a real pilot would, and even before it flies, just like a real pilot would, when I go to fly my plane, I have a whole checklist that I have to run through to make sure that plane is safe to fly. If anything on that checklist does not check out, I can't fly that plane. This does the same thing in a fully automated process. It can monitor all of its systems. It can monitor the temperatures of all of its systems. So it can tell that over time, is something starting to wear out? And if it is, I'm not gonna let myself fly because I need to get this fixed before I, I start putting more risk up into the air. And it's doing this the entire time while it's flying, monitoring battery health. Do I have enough battery to get back in a headwind and make a full landing approach? Are my components working properly? Are they starting to deteriorate while I'm flying? Do I need to get on the ground? How do I get on the ground safely? So it's constantly monitoring all of these different situations to ensure that it is safe while it's flying. And, and the big key is, and especially as we get into more and more of these UAS flying in the national airspace system, who are not pilots, who are not uh, experienced RC operators. We can educate so much, but we also need to be able to teach the technology how to be safe in a situation where um, an inexperienced operator may not know that he should not fly in an approach path of an airport. So being able to teach this what it can and cannot do. So this is a very, very rapidly growing industry. The FAA has projected that we will see 30,000 drones in the skies in the next five years. Well, I'll be the first to tell you that there are numerous manufacturers that have already sold 200,000 units inside the United States alone. So, and these are not going to experienced pilots. They're not the predator pilots. They're coming from the military. These are somebody buying it for a loved one for Christmas uh, with no experience. So this comes back to what I've, what I've been talking about of, we need to be able to teach this technology how to be safe, how to fly safely, What's okay to do, what's not okay to do. 
so that as the industry grows and as more at hundreds of thousands of these UAVs and small UAVs start to fly at low altitudes in the national airspace system, we need to be able to integrate them in a safe manner that brings down that risk. So we're really looking at, a, at, a, at the whole community as a whole, from the aviation aspect, the pilots flying real aircraft. What are their risks when we have small UAVs flying at low altitudes? To um, the, the UAVs themselves, how do we prevent a small quadcopter that weighs three pounds from running into something, or flying over a congested area where it shouldn't be, or dropping into a crowd? So really working as a community as a whole to start pushing forward on the technology and the education to ensure that we can integrate these safely into the airspace system um, by building that technology around it. And that's where we've been developing this technology as well as other commercial companies that we can start to integrate into these systems. Our iteration of this is called Lattice. It stands for Low Altitude Tracking and Avoidance System. This is really a, a technology that we've developed to be able to be integrated into small UAVs, very lightweight, at a very low cost, that a manufacturer can choose to integrate it, or an operator can choose to integrate it as myself into the autopilots that I'm already using, so that I can create a, a higher barrier of safety for myself and the people around me. So with Lattice, it, it's really built upon a system that has been in place for years. You, we always hear in the industry right now, especially as, as we talk about regulation coming out, how are, we, how are we going to track the UAVs at low altitudes? And, and we always hear that, well, we'll build new radar systems all over the country. We'll, we'll rely on the, the ADSB systems, which is required by the FAA for manned aircraft. Well, a lot of these systems will not work for small UASs because, one, a radar is not going to pick up this plane, especially at the altitudes that I'm flying at below 400 feet. Um, and the ADSB that manned aircraft currently uses, I can't pick that up until I'm at 1,500 feet up in the air. So I can't put those systems on this platform. It has to be a system that's lightweight, efe um, efficient, and low cost so that I can fit it in my DJI. I can fit it in this system, or I can fit it in my own quadcopter that I've built that's going to lower my risk of me doing something that I didn't know I should be doing. And, and the way this works, it, it utilizes current existing networking technologies uh, where we've partnered with uh, cellular companies uh, to really be able to connect these planes in real time to one another, connect them to the ground, connect them to real aircraft in the air so that we can provide a higher uh, barrier of risk, uh, or lower that barrier of risk so we don't risk getting it close to the aircraft so that we can start to do sense and avoid without building cameras onto the aircraft and doing it in a very easy system that's already in place. And so we, we've developed a system, and it's, it's very similar to an automated air traffic control system that if somebody so chooses to integrate that into their UAV, or if a manufacturer chooses to integrate that into their UAV, then in real time, over as low as the 2G cellular network, we can transmit back this aircraft's position in real time. And what that does is allows me to show real manned aircraft, where is this at? I can feed that up to the manned aircraft, and if I'm flying my small plane at low altitude, I might be able to actually see this on my iPad while I'm flying, just like I do the, the other Cessnas around me and the other airliners around me. But at the same time, since I can send data from the plane over the cellular network, I can send data back up to it. And what I can send back up to it is what's going to allow me to provide a sense and avoid system. So um, the key for this, this lattice system is being able to, to provide a situational awareness to bring down my risk so that I, I know where other aircraft are, I might be able to tell other people where I'm flying, and, and really provide a safer integration of the UAS into the national airspace. So this is just a screenshot of what, what the application may look like. And I do want to keep in mind that this is a system that we've fully prototyped, we've tested it, we've tested the sense and avoid under our COAS uh, to really show that this can be a technology to make flying the UAS safe, especially for inexperienced pilots. So here's an example of, of a module that I might be able to, to choose to use, that I can go and, and submit a flight plan, just like I as a pilot, when I fly my real aircraft, I have to submit a flight plan to the FAA. I'm telling them where I'm going, who I am, what I want to do, how high I want to fly, 
and they submit it and they use that so that they can route other traffic around me to provide a safer environment while I'm flying. Same in the same sense for the small UAVs that, okay, well maybe I want to fly here. I want to submit this, tell people where I'm flying so that if a manned aircraft gets close, then okay, the air traffic controller can route that aircraft around because of low level UAV flights and, and really be able to show other UAV operators where I'm at. And, and being able to track this in real time, which, which is key so that those, those manned aircraft, and we see it on the news all the time, that uh, an airliner on approach saw a DJI out the window and had a near miss. And we see it happening on a more constant basis. And especially as, as we start to have more operators inside the US airspace, we're going to see this happen more and more and more. And it's not because they're doing it on purpose. Most of the times it's an ex inexperienced operator that doesn't know what airspace is, that doesn't know they're, they're not supposed to be flying within five miles of an airport, and that doesn't know they shouldn't be flying over 400 feet. We can do so much with education, but at some point I believe that we also need to be able to teach that technology that I'm within five miles of an airport. I shouldn't be flying here, so I'm, I'm not gonna fly here. Or I shouldn't go be able to go over 400 feet and allow that system to, to help me fly safer. So, and, and that really brings it down to being able to provide a sense and avoid in a small package as well. And sense and avoid is a hot topic. Uh, it's been around since the 80s. Commercial airliners have actually had sense and avoid for decades. Uh, as a commercial airliner, if they're on, an, on a collision path, they will actually take corrective action. They talk to each other and they will change their, their altitude so that they do not collide. Being able to provide a similar solution to, to avoid air obstacles and ground obstacles in such a small lightweight package without putting cameras on, putting LiDAR sensors on, a three pound airplane, which are very expensive. I can suddenly send up and teach this plane what its surroundings are. So pulling from the FAA, the FAA can tell me exactly where every manned aircraft is that they're picking up on radar. I can feed that back to the UAV and so that it knows that, okay, a mile away at this heading, at this altitude, there's a small aircraft at low altitude. If I get closer to it, then I need to take corrective action to get away from it. Same thing with other UAVs, same thing for ground obstacles. It personally cannot see those ground obstacles, but since we're so um, heavy in GIS, we've mapped our entire world. We know where every building's at. We know where every tree line's at. Most states have mapped their entire state with LIDAR, so we know down to the foot where that terrain is and how tall this tree is and where every tower is. And same thing with windmills. So we can teach that small UAV what its surroundings are in real time so that it can provide a sense and avoid functionality while it's flying on a very small, lightweight, cost-effective package. So if I'm, if I'm a UAV operator or I'm a UAV manufacturer, then I can integrate this technology into my UAV to provide me a safer flight atmosphere with less risk so that I don't risk flying in the approach path of an airliner or I don't risk flying over um, a populated area or flying into a tower or flying into a building. So wrapping everything together, um, really on the commercial UA UAV side, it's really about the data. What are we doing with that data? How, how do we take that and pull useful information out of it and apply that to what I'm doing in my business enterprise right now? It's not so much about the UAV platform. Yeah, it's great that it flies, but if I could get the same data from a, a 300 foot step ladder, then I don't have the risk of this flying through the air. I'd rather do that. It just so happens that this is the most efficient, effective way to get some of the, these data forms today. And being able to integrate this technology as the people that need the data are not pilots, they're not experienced, being able to teach this technology how to be safe while I'm flying so that I don't have to put myself at risk of doing damage to something else. So that's what we're doing at Precision Hawk. That's a brief interview, inter introduction to what we're doing on the data side and, and really just a glimpse at what might be possible in the next couple of years of what we can do with this, this technology. A nice warm round of applause for a great presentation, Tyler Collins. Thank you, Tyler.